welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. It's me and Beth rocking and rolling. Beth, who have we got on today? Yes, so we have Jessica Mineri today, which we're really looking forward to the chat. So Jessica is a PhD candidate working on the interplay of gender, violence and political culture in the high and late medieval Mediterranean. So lots of fun medieval chat for today. Hi, Jessica. Hello, thank you so much for having me on. Please do not judge my lack of medievalness. Feel free to laugh at my knowledge of medievalness. (laughs) <laughs> Sounds and good. <laughs> if I pronounce something wrong, feel free to mock me then too. So the floor is open for you. Let's kick off with the first question because we're not just doing any medieval period because usually we say, oh, look, we can do the medieval period, it's usually England. We're not. We're going far out this time. We're going out of the box. We're heading into the Mediterranean. So talk to us what is happening in the Mediterranean during the medieval period. Yes, so we're a little far afield from England. We're dealing with mainly the Iberian Peninsula, the Italian Peninsula, Northern Africa, and then also Western Asia. So after the fall of the Roman Empire, the Mediterranean is really just like this giant meeting place for pretty much every culture and linguistic group and religious group that is left in the area after the fall of Rome. You have a bunch of empires like the Byzantines, and then after the seventh century, you have the Islamic Caliphates trying to vie for power over territory, particularly in Iberia and in southern Italy. So the Mediterranean, particularly from about 500 to 1500, is a place of trade. You always have people and pirates, too. Pirates are all over the place sailing around the Mediterranean between port cities such as Barcelona, Palermo, and in southern France as well, vying for power. So in the early Middle Ages, we have the Byzantine Empire trying to take control of places like Sicily and Sardinia and Naples. While you also have like the emerging emirate of Sicily coming into the to the power vacuum there, trying to kick, kick the Byzantines out. But I'm really focused on the later Middle Ages. So the later Middle Ages are a little challenging as well, because you have the crown of Aragon from the region in Aragon and Catalonia and Spain around Barcelona, competing with the Angevin Empire, which is a, really like a branch from the Capetian dynasty of France, who had set up shop in Naples and is trying to pretty much fight with the Spanish over control of the island of Sicily. So there's really just these two giant powers going back and forth with one another fighting for territory. So the Mediterranean is kind of a bit of a crazy place during the Middle Ages. It's really the center of the action. Before Beth jumps in, the one comment I want to make, the only thing I know, and I'm hoping to learn more now, only thing I know, you know exactly where I'm going to go with this, so you might as well start laughing away. Only thing I know about the Aragons are well, King Henry VIII. <laughs> yeah, Catherine of Aragon is always the jump out for everyone. <laughs> I th- so I don't feel so alone. That's fine. We're good. We're good. Yeah, she, I mean, she was also my introduction really to everything going on in Aragon as well. I didn't before I I really got interested in Mediterranean history. English history was really my first love. So particularly the Tudor period. So Catherine of Aragon was really the introduction to it all. So it's the same for me. We're good. It's fine. We Yeah, we all got introduced by Catherine. It's all good. <laughs> we did. <laughs> <laughs> and side note, I love her family, former residence, the Alhambra in Spain. Just, yeah, anyone who hasn't been, it's amazing. Go and see it if you can. It is. <laughs> and we're gonna um, we're gonna talk a lot about Spain and about the House of Aragon today. But first let's let's set a picture of Spain at this time in, in the period of the Middle Ages you're looking at. What was it like? What was going on? What was the culture? Yeah, so the Spain is really different than a lot of what is going on in the rest of Europe, particularly because of the Islamic expansion into the Iberian Peninsula in 711, and that leads to something that a lot of people know as the Reconquest, where it's this fight between the Islamic empires and then also the Christian kingdoms of the north over territory. So for most of the, really, the Iberian Middle Ages, you have kingdoms such as Navarre in the north, which is around the modern city of Pamplona, 
The crown of Aragon centered around the modern city of Barcelona, Castile Leon, which is near Toledo in modern Madrid. And then you also have Portugal starting to emerge and some other smaller kingdoms. They're really fighting for territory between Al-Andalus, which is the Islamic caliphate that is in the southern area of the peninsula, near actually where the Alhambra ends up being. So there's this pretty much a lot of fight fighting that goes back on and forth over about 700 years between about 711 and 1492. All of these kingdoms are kind of going back and forth. So that is kind of really a lot of the context of what I'm looking at, because I'm really focused on the crown of Aragon later, once this period starts to, to die down. Because once the crown of Aragon starts to conquer all the territory around Barcelona and a lot of the other cities in what is now the county of Aragon and then the county of Catalonia, they start to kind of want to reach into southern France, also the Balearic Islands near modern Majorca, Ibiza, and Menorca, and then also eventually they start looking into Italy. So this whole idea of expansion and reconquest really eventually starts to even go beyond Iberia. But for most of the Middle Ages, it's really just a meeting place for people, for Christian people, for Islamic people, and for Jewish people in Iberia, with periods of, of harmony, not as much as it gets credit for, because it was also very violent. There was also a lot of tension between these three groups. But it was really very different than the rest of what was going on in the Middle Ages, because areas like even for England, for example, wasn't really, well, I guess in Wales and Scotland and Ireland was focused on conquest, but in, in different ways and for different reasons. So Iberia is kind of like an outlier a little bit. I have an off-topic question. It might be an intimate yeah. question, actually. So basically, we've talked about religion, or you've mentioned religion. But what about race? Because the only, the, mm. I remember from one of the TV programs that I watched. Yeah, I'm going to bring in TV. Let's judge me. <laughs> one of the TV programs I, I watched, you had a mixture of Africans and um, I think there may have been some Middle Eastern involved in there. Is this a complete and utter melting pot at this point? Oh, absolutely. I think I might know the show you're talking about. Would that be the Spanish princess about Catherine of Aragon? Because there's a little bit of that going Maybe. on. <laughs> Maybe might might that might be what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, that show gets a lot of that right because there is Spain really is a melting pot of this period. Even a lot of historians that are looking at this period right now, between art historians and then regular historians, are looking at this period through a lens of race because there are people from Africa, from the Middle East, pretty much all around Europe, Africa, well, Northern Africa at least and Western Asia find themselves in Iberia, mainly because of Al-Andalus and the attraction there from the other caliphates that are in North Africa and Western Asia. So it kind of is, like if you're gonna look at race in the Middle Ages, Iberia is a great place to look because a lot of the manuscript drawings depict Muslim people as blue, which is quite strange, especially for a modern observer, they do this to show racial and religious difference. So yeah, if you look at some of the manuscripts, particularly from the crusade of Saladin and Richard the Lionheart, there's this famous one where Saladin appears blue, and that is definitely on purpose. So race is all over this. Oh no, that's fascinating. And we're going to dig down um, a little bit deeper into the House of Aragon before going on to talk about some specific queens. Can you just introduce us to some of the, the key facts about the house that we may not know about those of us who are more Catherine of Aragon knowledgeable? Yeah, so Catherine of Aragon comes from, well, she's descended of both the House of Barcelona and then the House of Trastevere in Castile Leon, Aragon. But if we go back to the House of Barcelona, so they were in charge in the crown of, or what becomes the crown of Aragon for quite a while. They originate in the city of Barcelona when it is the county of Catalonia. And it becomes the crown of Aragon through marriage of Queen Petronella of Aragon and Count Raymond Berenger from Catalonia. Once those two marry, the crown of Aragon is born and the House of Barcelona dynasty becomes a kingdom. And from most of its history, it goes on, especially by medieval and early modern standards, it goes on for quite a while. Petronilla's marriage is in 1137, and then the last uh, ruler of the House of Barcelona dies in 1410. So they are ruling for most of this period of reconquest and violence that's going on in Iberia. For some of the main casting characters that you should know from this dynasty are James I. He's sometimes called the Conqueror because he is really interested in bringing his authority outside of Iberia and he wants to control territory near like modern cities like Montpellier and Perpignan. So he really wants to become like a king of southern France as well. 
and and also the island of Majorca, that famous invasion of the island is done by him. Like if you walk around the city of Palma right now, you see statues of him all over because he is the one that brings Aragonese territory there. So he is ruling in the 13th century. So he is probably, if not the most famous Aragonese monarch in the Middle Ages, he might be one of the most famous Spanish monarchs because he is, if you go to Spain, he's everywhere. So he's really important. But then as you go further on, another famous and important figure is Peter IV of Aragon. He's sometimes called Peter IV the Ceremonious. So he's famous for a few reasons. He gets in a very famous war with uh, a similarly named Peter of Castile. So their war is sometimes called either the War of the Two Pedros or the War of the Two Peters, whether you want to use the Spanish or the English names. So they famously get in a war over territory. Aragon is expanding outward into southern France and all these territories in Italy is kind of a threat to the rest of the Iberian Peninsula because they see Aragon as something that's expanding and is eventually going to take them over too. So this is really a fight between territory. It gets pretty crazy. Peter IV of Aragon ends up being kidnapped and imprisoned a few times, which is seems to be a common thing that these Spanish kings do to each other. So he eventually gets out and the war settles itself. But he's famous also for taking over the Kingdom of Sicily and then also taking over the uh, Balearic Islands after James I. Because James I brings Aragonese authority to Majorca in the 13th century, but he creates a new dynasty and allows them to rule Majorca on their own. And Peter IV ends this. He wants to take Majorca for his own and he wants that dynasty to die out. And though he does the same in Sicily. So if you're going to know beyond Catherine of Aragon and how excellent she is, if you're going to know some figures in Aragonese history, James I and Peter IV of Aragon are the two hot spots. So we're going to be talking about queens. However, before we get to this point, I'm interested in knowing, apart from the queens we're going to be talking about, because I'm assuming one of them may be your favorite, which yeah. one of these <laughs> rulers for you is your favorite or most important or any of the above? Well, as much as Peter the Fourth of Aragon gets in trouble in a, a project I'm working on because he's kidnapping a lot of queens and does some terrible things, he is my favorite. I'm always coming back to learning more about him. He rules in Aragon for a really long time, at least by medieval standards. He's empowered from 1336 to 1387, and during that time period, he gets a lot accomplished. He is involved with one of those wars in the Iberian Peninsula, but also other ones outward. He brings really a lot of the Catalan culture to the city of Palermo in Sicily as well. So he is, and he's called the Ceremonious because he famously crowned himself. Instead of some Aragonese kings would do this, their coronation ceremonies were a little bit different. But he famously crowned himself as king. So if somebody does that, that's pretty funny. (laughs) He takes the crown himself and does it. Which, if you look at England at that time period, that's the kind of thing is not exactly happening and wouldn't really. He kind of strikes me almost as like a Henry VIII figure of like the 14th century. He's very funny. Bit of a badass. Yeah. And we have to um, obviously talk about some of the queens that you've been researching in this period as well. Can you tell us about some of those? Yeah. So I have a few cases of queens in Sicily and the island of Majorca that I'm working on really during Peter the Fourth of Aragon's reign. So that's part of the reason why he's one of my favorites. Hold on. So these, Does he kidnap yeah. them all? Yes. Okay. So we have kidnap. Okay. Hit us with the kidnapped queens. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He does some pretty insane things, Um, particularly in one queen, Maria of Sicily. So she is actually his granddaughter. She's the queen of Sicily from about 1377 to 1401. She's a member of a separate branch of the House of Barcelona, because once the Kingdom of Aragon expanded into Sicily in the early 14th century, they, similar to Majorca, established a new dynasty that was supposed to kind of function under their rule, but be almost independent. So Maria is this young 14-year-old queen. She comes to the throne. She's the last really surviving member of her dynasty. So there's some worry in Barcelona of, oh, no, if Maria marries someone else, Or if she dies without an heir, do we still have some kind of control of Sicily? What's going to happen to that? So since Maria is 14 years old when she becomes queen, she has to have regions, like the case would be in England as well. 
But instead of having one, she had four regents known as the four vicars. So from some powerful families in Bar or in Palermo, rather, we have the Cheramonte family, the Alagona family, the Ventimiglia family, and the Peralta family. So they are controlling her. They're keeping her under their lock and guard. They want to make sure that what happens with Maria will be beneficial for them because many of them do not like Peter IV of Aragon. They don't want him interfering with their business. So Maria is holding court in the city of Catania on, in eastern Sicily in 1377 when her grandfather decides, I don't want these vicars to control her marriage because they are thinking of marry, marrying her into the lordship of Milan to really get the Iberians out of Sicily and keep it closer into Italian affairs. Peter decides, I actually don't want this. I need something to do about it. So he hires one of his noblemen to go to Catania, pull her out of her court, and kidnap her. So she is, yeah, so she is his prisoner, essentially. This goes on for 10 years. He gets her, or over 10 years, actually. He gets her in 1377. She's kept in castles in Licata in southern Sicily, Cagliari in Sardinia, and then one in Valencia very quickly, and then she's almost going to be put in a monastery in Barcelona just to kind of hold her there. But they end up because of, this is going on during the Black Death as well. There's outbreaks of it all over the place. They have to keep shuffling her around to avoid that. So she doesn't get out of Aragonese custody until about 1390, when they decide, okay, it's been a long enough. She's been in our possession for a very long time. We need to figure out what to do with her marriage before. Because at this point, she's about in her mid-20s. They need to decide what they're going to do with her. So Peter IV of Aragon has just died, and his son, Joan I, decides that she is going to marry his nephew, who is the grandson of Peter IV, Martin. So she marries Martin, she returns to Sicily, and she becomes queen again. And so she is one of about like four or five queens that Pierre the Four or Peter the Fourth kidnapped. I have a question. Sorry, yeah. just before we move on. Right, so she goes back. What has... <laughs> What's been going on in Sicily in the time period she's been? It's about what? It's about 10 years, give or take, right? So what is actually happening in Sicily? Who's ruling? Who's taking care of everything? Which is the crazy part, because her four regents decide, okay, well, if our queen is going to be held in prison and we don't know if or when she'll ever come back to us, we kind of have to step in and fill that power vacuum. So you have these four men who are in charge of these four important noble, noble families across all of Sicily, vying for power. In Palermo, which is, of course, the capital of Sicily now, but is also a very important city at the time, the Cheramonte family are in charge. And then Freddy Fer Cheramonte, as Maria's regent, decides, I'm going to control Palermo and western Sicily. This is my territory. So then you have these four groups really kind of keeping things together, but kind of not in this period. There's rebellion. And when they get wind in the early 1390s that Maria is actually coming back, the Aragonese have married her off and they're ready to install her back on her throne. They have problems with that, actually. They have decided they don't mind her being gone because it, it works out better for them because they're in charge. Why would they want her back? So the four of them come up with this pact that they are going to resist Aragonese rule and her return. Well, only one of them sticks to this pact, which is pretty funny. <laughs> Once the Aragonese come back, they get, they get scared and they just kind of like bow down to their authority while one figure, Manfredi Cheramonte, decides, no, actually, I have a palace in Palermo. I'm doing pretty well for myself. I want it to stay this way. It ends up not really working out for him. He ends up dying and his son is beheaded and they take over their palace anyway, the Aragonese. So it, it does not work out. Hold on. <laughs> Why have we not made a Netflix drama series about this? Because this is a mess. Uh, you really could make a great show out of this. Sicily in the 14th century and a little bit into the 15th is such a mess between all of these noblemen trying to really get their say in things and then you have the crown of aragon kind of interfering it gets even worse after maria dies like the next several the next queen and her husband do as poor of a job it does not end up working out keep going 
tell us. We need to know. I need to know more now. I'm really, I know Beth's invested. We're both invested. We're like, yeah, with Maria, she ends up ruling in Sicily. So this is 1392 and she comes back to the throne. She dies in 1401. So in that time, the pressure is really on her to have an heir. So she is able to have one son that they also named Peter after Peter the Fourth of Aragon, which seems pretty nuts if he's the one who kidnapped her, but that's what they end up doing. She, this child doesn't end up living. The way he dies is actually pretty terrible. In Palermo, they were at the royal family. We're at a jousting event. And as you can imagine, you have Maria holding her son. And as you can imagine, an event like that, like similarly what happens with Henry the uh, Henry the Eighth when he gets that leg injury, a spear goes loose and it hits the the infant, so the the young Peter, and he ends up dying of his wounds. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty terrible. Maria does not take this well, and she herself dies only a few months later. Some sources say she dies of plague. I think maybe it was probably, I mean, I'm not doubting that she had played. I'm sure she did. I'm sure it was a, a mixture of emotional grief that she was going through. And then the plague coming in and infecting her probably did not help. So from start to finish, she has kind of a really topsy-turvy and very hard life. She spends so much time in isolation as a prisoner. Then she comes back to Sicily and things get not great, pretty much not great for her. And her successor as... Queen Blanca of Navarre marries her husband Martin, and things from there you go pretty crazy. So Martin of Aragon in 1409, or Martin of Sicily, I should say, not of Aragon, goes to Sardinia in 1409 with the intention of, oh, the Aragonese, the crown of Aragon, decides that they also want to take over the island of Sardinia, and they need King Martin to help them with that. Well, as things go with this dynasty, that doesn't work out well either. He ends up get contracting malaria in Sardinia and he dies. So once he is dead, all you have left is the young Blanca of Navarre left in, in Sicily as his, because she was his queen. She was ruling as his regent when she left. So she's just kind of, okay, I guess I'm keeping going with this regency thing. And things get worse from there. I need to know more. I'm invested. Keep going. Tell us what go. Why does everything become so much more worse? <laughs> it is pretty comical how bad things get, and they get even even crazier. So Blanca as regent, the Aragonese decide, okay, we'll take we'll take our current king. So that is the Martin that died, Martin of Sicily. His father is also named Martin. So he becomes Martin II of Sicily, and he rules both Aragon and Sicily at the same time, but Blanca is to stay in Sicily as his regent so she can handle things on the ground. This arrangement lasts from about summer of 1409 to May of 1410, because wouldn't you know it, Martin II of Sicily slash Martin I of Aragon dies of the plague himself. So now, <laughs> now we're left with just Blanca, and she is queen of Sicily, but there's a problem as well. Because with his death, he has no other heirs that could take the throne. Aragon now does not have a king. And this is the end of the line of the House of Barcelona and Aragon. So because of that, you have a few years from about 1410 to 1412 where Aragon does not have a king at all. They're really just governed by the, the parliament that is there. And a few lords are taking care of their local areas. But there's really no king at all. For Blanca, this is actually pretty terrible because she's left to be regent kind of on her own and keep Sicily kind of going, but then also maybe keep the potential going for it to one day rejoin the crown of Aragon. Well, I mentioned the local nobility earlier when I was talking about Maria. They similarly have problems with Blanca. They decide they with now that the king of Aragon is dead, and that their king of Sicily, Blanca's husband, is also dead, that this is the prime opportunity for Sicily to become an independent kingdom and to get the Iberians out completely. To do that, a group of noblemen led by Bernardo Cabrera decides we can use Blanca as our queen. She can stay here. We'll just make her marry one of our noblemen, a man named Nicholas Peralta, who was the son of one of Maria's vicars, so her, her regents. So to do that, Blanca's not going to commit to that 
and she's not going to consent to that because she wants to return home to Navarre because she's a princess there and she eventually becomes the heir there as well. So she doesn't want to hang around. She just wants to finish out her regency and then go back to Pamplona. Well, to do that, Cabrera decides, well, Maria was in prison before this, and there's this long context in European history at this point of imprisoning and kidnapping queens. So Cabrera thinks that he can do this with her as well. So he basically, her entire reign from 1409 to 1415, when she finally leaves Sicily, is her being chased around the Sicilian island by this man and his his small army that are trying to kidnap her and force her into this marriage. She famously leaves castles in Palermo and then also in Ragusa. While this man is trying to kidnap her, he ends up not being successful. There's some court documents that go back and forth in Barcelona. One from Blanca's father, who is also the king of Navarre, Charles III, and also officials in Sicily saying, some wild stuff is going on over there. This man's trying to kidnap the queen because he wants to install someone else as king along with her, and we need this to stop. It eventually, <laughs> it's pretty insane, but it eventually does calm down once the Aragonese hold a compromise known as the Compromise of Caspe, where they sit in this town in Aragon and elect a new king, which ends up being Ferdinand I, and he is from Castile. So he's from the Trastamara dynasty. So this is the dynasty that produces Isabella of Castile later on in the 15th century, where we get Spain from. So once he's in, he decides, okay, maybe we should deal with what's going on in Sicily. The queen is, is running from her for her life, essentially, around the entire island while this man is trying to pretty much ruin the dynasty. So he intervenes and Cabrera is imprisoned and Blanca by 1415 is able to go home. So this this whole mess does not finish with Maria. It gets even worse. How can this possibly get any worse? <laughs> it's Sicily, at least after this point, things calm down. But a few se- decades before in Majorca, there are also some queens that get kidnapped there. So it, it, it doesn't get that much better. Oh my god. Okay, hit it, hit it, hit us with this because both Beth and I are sitting with our heads in our hands going, what the hell is happening? (laughs) It is pretty insane. In Majorca, it's a lot of the same reasons that Peter IV of Aragon decides that he wants to take over the island of Majorca. He wants to end the dynasty that was set up there under James I. So in Majorca, the island is now ruled by James III of Majorca, and he has two queens that are going to be central to the story. We have Constance of Aragon, who is also the sister of Peter IV of Aragon, and we have Vailant of Villa Regut, so she is his second wife the, that comes later. So in this moment, James III of Majorca doesn't like the idea that his monarchy should be dismantled so that Peter IV can end it and then take over the kingdom. He wants to remain an independent kingdom. because Majorca at this point is the entire Balearic Island chain. So all three of those islands are included, but also the king there it controls territory in southern France. So it's kind of a strange kingdom the way it's set up. It's like you have this island chain and then these, these cities in southern France that are under his control. So with that, Peter IV, if he took over that kingdom, would gain a lot of territory and with that, a lot of money from the taxes from that, those places. So James III puts up a fight because he does not want to go peacefully. This results in him traveling to Barcelona to really kind of broker this deal with his his cousin. Peter IV is also his cousin. And when he gets there, his wife, Constance, is taken into custody as collateral. They figure if they have the king of Majorca's wife, who's also the sister of the king of Aragon, that they will basically be able to control things. James will go peacefully if they have his wife. Of course, that's that's never how it goes. It's never that simple. So Constance of Aragon pretty much spends years in, in Mayor or Aragonese captivity. She's held in the city of Barcelona, and she's eventually released into the city of Montpellier and dies shortly afterwards. Hold on, you, you just okay, okay. So <laughs> it's just it's just one. There's nothing nice and stable about this podcast i was like yay we're gonna get to know about some cool badass no no everything is having an absolute shit (laughs) form exactly like a lot of 
this period is pretty crazy, not even just in Aragon, outward in Europe too, like so much mess is going on between the plague and the Hundred Years War, that these these cases seem strange out of context, but there are so many, even queens in other places around the same time that also get kidnapped. So this is a very strange phenomenon that continues to happen. It, it's very odd. But in Majorca, things kind of, you would think after Constance of Aragon's death, that that would be the last queen that gets imprisoned. Well, that's not true. So <laughs> James remarries a Valencian noblewoman by Lant, and she becomes the new queen of Majorca as this struggle is going on. After, so this is 1346, this leads to a bunch of military battles between the Aragonese and the Majorcan dynasties trying to force the end of that kingdom and this leads to pretty much the penultimate battle in 1349 on the island of Majorca, the battle of Luca Mayor, which is a town that's not too far from the city of Palma you can go and see the, the battle site now at that battle site James III is struck down so with him he's gone so the, all that is left is his new queen by law and he has two children that were from his first marriage to Constance of Aragon we have He's sometimes called James the Fourth of Majorca, but he never actually reigns as king. It's kind of a pretended title that he kind of hang on hangs on to until he dies, so he's known as James the Fourth. And his young sister Isabella. So once the king dies, they are taken into Aragonese custody at the battle and imprisoned in a series of places. For James, his imprisonment is actually worse than the two women in this case. Believe it or not, he is held in an iron cage in the city of Barcelona for about like 13, 14 years. He doesn't get out until 1362. Hold on. I need to know about this iron cage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because my my imagination has gone wild is that he literally lives like in this tiny little cell that he can't move like a cage. What kind of cage are we talking about? Yeah, so his whole thing is pretty strange. So he's held in the Barcelona, the Aragonese courts in Barcelona, and it, it's it's as it sounds. He's allowed about one or two hours out of the cage, but at night and during the day, he is forced into this cage. So it sounds like a cage you would think of as like a modern prison cell, but it's not attached to walls. It's, it's literally a cage. So he is put in there and then locked in at night because they are afraid that he is somehow going to escape, and he eventually does. But we'll get to that in a second. So they are afraid that he is going to escape and that he is going to try to mount this claim back to Majorca and then everything that's happened with the Aragonese takeover is going to be undone. So they basically keep him, they starve him, they keep him in this cage, and he is essentially, this is the worst kind of imprisonment that you could get as a ruler or not to be in this kind of conditions must have been terrible. And there are letters later in his life, because he eventually does marry Queen Joanna the I of Naples. There's letters from people at her court that are observing his behavior. And he is, you can tell he must have had some kind of post-traumatic stress from this because he is very, like, very, the way he rations food, because he's so afraid that he's never going to get any because of what he went through. And he is very much afraid and traumatized for the rest of his life. And it's apparent later on. So yeah, he is in this cage until he eventually mounts an escape in 1362. He's able to slip out at night and he makes it out of the city of Barcelona and sails straight to Naples to marry Queen Joanna. He kind of pretty much throws himself on her as for mercy. He sees that she will, because she does not like Peter the Fourth of Aragon, but he thinks that she is the person to go to. This is just, yeah. just a wild ride, isn't it? <laughs> Just, yeah. Wow, so much happening. Uh, <laughs> but the cage does lead us on nicely to another question we wanted to discuss with you, um, which is about the conditions for the queens who were imprisoned. Because, I mean, putting aside, um, you know, James's horrible experiences, I mean, typically as members of the nobility, as queens or princesses, I'm assuming that, you know, they, they, did, they didn't have like the worst conditions for their imprisonment, that they did have some kind of luxuries or, or servants and things. Right. So that's that's a good question to think about this, because for the queens, especially in this Mayorkan case, they are kept differently. They aren't put in an iron cages, which is nice for them. They are first brought to a monastery in the city of Valencia, where they are just kept among the nuns who are living there. And they kind of are almost like they aren't allowed to join the religious order themselves. They're pretty much kept there. and The nuns are supposed to look after them. 
So for most queens that found themselves in this position, that's exactly right. Like they wouldn't necessarily be in an iron cage. They wouldn't be in a dungeon. Like we always tend to think of these castles with these scary dungeons at the bottom. In some cases, sure, people were kept there. But if you were a queen who was a prisoner, most of the time you were kept in a tower or in a monastery and isolated and kept with members of your your household. You might have servants with you attending to you. And you were probably, for the most part, well-fed and clothed. Like, there are some examples where that that wasn't the case for queens of France who found themselves in this position. But at least for Marie of Sicily and then also these Mayorkan women, it wasn't as awful as it was for James IV. He really got the bottom of the barrel. So these women in Mallorca, they are pretty much kept in this monastery. And then one of them, by law, is kept in a tower for a brief period. And then they are eventually released with the condition that they will never try to reclaim the island kingdom of Majorca and that they have to marry who Peter IV of Aragon says. So for compared, comparison to James IV, they have it a lot easier. You just touched on medieval prisons. Like you said, that's what we imagine. We imagine a castle with a dingy, like, dark dungeon, with these big giant gates. I think TV's to blame for this because that's how I imagine a prison or at least a medieval prison, were they actually like that or are our imaginations going wild? So I, not that prisons were super great in the medieval period. They definitely were, depending on where you are. So it, a lot of times it depends on gender. That's a factor in it. It depends on if you're a noble or a royal, you're going to have like a better time of it if you're an average person. But the prisons we tend to think of are remnants of modern prisons where it's people behind bars and they're sitting there because they've committed a crime doesn't really pick up in the middle ages until like the later period you start to see inquisition prisons in southern france around cities like toulouse and perpignan and then you also have prisons arising in towns like florence and in the italian northern italian peninsula so those prisons are a lot different than what we would tend to think of people there had to pay for their stay they were not kept there for long durations like they are now like you wouldn't be given a life sentence and it was, you were in, held in a prison in the center of town. People could come and see you through the windows. It was very easy for these prisoners to escape, as many of them did. It's not like now where if you escape from a prison, there will be a manhunt to find you. If you escaped, it was definitely a lot easier to slip away. So in those instances, those start to really arise like the modern prison system in the later Middle Ages. But for royal women like we're talking about, they were either kept inside castles in a private room, locked away, like Eleanor of Aquitaine is famously kept this way. Or you're held in a monastery, which happens to a lot of royal women. You're pretty much kept there. You're not allowed to join the monastery itself as you can't become a nun. And you're just pretty much supposed to just stay there. The sisters there will take care of you. You'll basically be somewhat like a ward for them to take care of. This happens quite a lot. Or famously, as we tend to think of like women being like Rapunzel being kept in towers, this kind of thing happens as well. And that's pretty much you're kept in like what we would think of as like a royal apartment with a bedroom and things like that. And the door is locked and you're not allowed to leave. So it really varies. But the dungeons idea that we all have from TVs and movies is definitely there for some prisoners, like some noblemen were kept in these conditions like if you ever visit the tower of london you, you kind of can see some of them and there's all this signage about royal prisoners that were kept there like Anne Boleyn, pretty famously it wasn't fantastic to be in these places but unless you're james the fourth is the extreme but for the most part it wasn't as dingy as we think and uh, we could talk about this for so long like yeah it's been a wild ride chaos um, but we want to round us off uh, jessica and um, we wanted to just kind of imagine sicily and in particular palermo at this time just give us and our listeners just a picture of, of what it was like so palermo is from palermo along with messina and catania and eastern S- sicily are the main three cities that are really the bustling centers of the island of sicily so for most of Sicily's history from the late Roman period, really until the early modern period, Sicily and Palermo, particularly as a city, go through so many phases of being ruled by different entities. Sicily as an island that sits at the center of Mediterranean world is very attractive for most 
kingdoms and empires around it because one, it's the center of the, the trade that exists in the Mediterranean. Also, if you're on a ship, say going from the Iberian Peninsula or Morocco, and you're heading towards, say, the city of Jerusalem or somewhere in eastern Mediterranean, you need somewhere kind of to stop and to rest and really to gather up more supplies. So Sicily is really the stopping place for most people. So because of that, it's a city and an island that has been constantly changing hands in the Middle Ages. Like we start with the Byzantine Empire in the aftermath of the Roman period. Then it becomes an Islamic emirate shortly afterwards in the 9th and 10th centuries. Then it's controlled by the Norman dynasty, the same Norman people that conquer England in 1066. They also find their way into Sicily. They rule for a little while, and then we famously get the Hotville dynasty that produces the famous Frederick II, who is also the emperor. So he is born in, in Italy, and then he sets his court at Palermo. After that, we have the Angevins who come in, and they take control of the island of Sicily very briefly until it is then taken into control by the crown of Aragon, which eventually will become the Spanish Empire in the early modern period. So the city of Palermo, because of this, is one that is extremely multicultural, multilinguistic, and multireligious. Similar to what's going on in Al-Andalus and the other cities, the Iberian Peninsula, where you have many religions living in coexistence, that is also happening in Palermo. So it's a bustling market city. There's people of all backgrounds living and working in the city and interacting with it via its port. But at the time of Blanca of Navarre and Marie of Sicily, it's also unfortunately, the center of the medieval slave trade. So we tend to think of the slave trade as something that happens in the Atlantic and in the Roman period, but there was slavery in the medieval Mediterranean as well. And cities like Palermo, like Barcelona and Montpellier and all these other cities that are near the Mediterranean or hubs of trade also have slaves going in and out. So Palermo was really a center of that market. So that is also going on in the city. So if you travel to Palermo now, you can see kind of a lot of this left in a lot of the buildings that are there. The cathedral that sits at the center of it is really a Baroque building. Now it was rebuilt in the early modern period. But you could still travel and visit the Norman Palace where the Norman kings of Sicily held their court. There's still the Byzantine slash Norman mosaics at the St. Mary of the Admiral Church, which is not very far from the Norman Palace. And there's all these really buildings around the city that are remnant of this period. So Palermo is a multicultural hub as well as all of Sicily. But then it also has things like the slave trade and other trade that is going through it. So it's really a bustling hub as much as it is, as it is now. When are you going to publish your book on this? <laughs> Hopefully sometime soon. Once the, the dissertation on this is done, that'll be the next step so sometime within the next several years oh, no no got to be earlier than that I think our listeners <laughs> desperately want your book to come out or, as like the kidnapped queens of the Mediterranean or something I'll be an excellent book thank you yeah you really could write so much on this even if you take France and England into account there's so many queens particularly once Wales and Scotland and Ireland are taken over that get caught up in this as well so you could you could do a, a European history of this and you would never run out of material I love it I wish we could get your book on our on our bookshop but we don't but we are looking forward to your next book to come out I loved it I know Beth loved it we both had shock and horror and surprise and all sorts of emotions running through our faces while listening to you Jessica you've got to come back on think of a subject and we'll definitely get you back on to do something Oh, thank you. I would love to come back on. Thank you for having me. I look forward to that. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book. <laughs>